around the country beginning Monday, April 4th on C-SPAN. Next on C-SPAN, a close-up foundation form featuring a discussion about recent speeches that were given on college campuses by representatives of the Nation of Islam. Representatives from the Jewish community have objected to the speeches, and in this program you're about to see, you'll hear both sides of the issue. Those addressing the close-up students are Hyman Bookbinder of the American Jewish community and Azkia Muhammad, the news director for Pacifica Radio's WPFW in Washington. In this program, they also take questions from the close-up audience. Hello and welcome to this week's Close-Up Foundation discussion program. We're going to be talking today about recent speeches made by Nation of Islam members and the reaction to those speeches. It's going to be a little different from our normal program where you hear primarily from high school students. We have a group of university students joining us today from different schools here in the Washington, D.C. area. But I'll tell you who's going to be with us. Uh, we have students from Howard University, American University, George Washington University, and Georgetown University. And what we like to do on the program is when you stand up and ask your questions, if you tell us your name and where you're from. And maybe even what you're studying. I don't know, whatever vitals you want to tell us about yourself before you make your comments or ask your questions. Let me introduce you to our guest. Joining us today is Hyman Bookbinder. Mr. Bookbinder retired from the American Jewish Committee where he worked from 1967 until 1988 and now serves as its advisor. He's worked in Washington, D.C. for over 40 years on civil rights issues. That includes some work on presidential commissions. He served under three administrations, the uh, Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, and, uh, the Pres and President Carter's administration. Welcome to the discussion, Mr. Bookbinder. Thank you. Also joining us is Askia Mohammed. He is news director at Pacifica Radio. And Mr. Mohammed has been a Washington correspondent since 1977 and is founding producer of the morning news program Audio Evidence. He also is editorial columnist for the Washington Informer and the Sacramento Observer and has been a commentator on national public radio. He was also editor-in-chief of the newspaper of the Nation of Islam and he served as assistant to the Nation of Islam founder, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Mr. Muhammad. Thank you. I thought we could begin with a few questions up here before we turn to our audience. Uh, first thing I'd like you to do is uh, if you could characterize for us uh, the reaction to the recent speeches uh, made by Khalil Abdul Muhammad and then his subsequent suspension uh, by Mr. Farrakhan. Uh, Mr. Bookbinder, can we begin with you? Well, let me uh, start by saying that uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you, Mr. Muhammad, and uh, I hope we, we're not going to have a debate or a quarrel. Uh, we're both going to examine a very, very painful development, uh, and I hope that we can find some grounds that we agree on. Um, the speech the speeches that you refer to in this recent period started with a speech made uh, by another Mr. Muhammad uh, at Kane College in New Jersey. It was uh, done to a relatively small group, but it got national coverage when people, including George, uh, uh, not George, but Roger Wilkins, a very esteemed black journalist and scholar, uh, wrote about it. It was a speech that contained some of the worst uh, poison, garbage, canards about the, uh, ju the, the history of Jews. And so it could not be ignored once it was known that that was done, so it got to a larger audience. It contained very, very, uh, or totally incredible accusations, but incredible accusations nevertheless are heard, and unless they're contradicted, unless they're counteracted, unless they're repudiated, people accept them as the truth. And so what happened after that speech was a, a rather difficult, uh, painful battle among Jews and blacks as to the extent to which other people have a responsibility to repudiate, to condemn things that are obviously uh, untrue or clearly untrue, could be proven to be untrue. Uh, in time, uh, distinguished black leaders, uh, Puerto Rican leaders, uh, uh, ethnic leaders of every group, but primarily, I want to stress that I am pleased with the reaction overall uh, of black leaders, including Jesse Jackson, including the president of Harvard, uh, of Howard University, in one way or another said they do indeed repudiate the kinds of things said by uh, Khalid Mohammed, and included also the condemnation by Mr. Farrakhan who then went on to say, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it, that he doesn't really disagree with the substance, but he thinks it was a vile, vicious, repugnant, mean-spirited speech. 
So we're getting a consensus that that kind of speech is really ought to be considered intolerable. And we're continuing to discuss how to meet the challenge, because it's a challenge not only to what kind of rhetoric is used, but it's a challenge which may disturb what has been for me one of the most glorious parts of my many years of participation in social action, and that is the black Jewish cooperation over the years, which has characterized our relations rather than black Jewish conflict. Okay, Mr. Mohammed. You know, um, Dr. Khalid Abdul Mohammed is rather an atypical representative. He's a black man who has a PhD. He's taught uh, African American studies at Long Beach State University. He has a black belt in karate. And he has uh, even served time in prison for um, uh, income tax uh, problems that he had. He's uh, what you might consider uh, uh, an unafraid, uh, a bold, uh, as uh, a brash captain as Ossie Davis described Malcolm X in his eulogy, a bold captain who uh, speaks a rage that is uh, often found but often not expressed among a lot of people in this society. His remarks were unfortunate, uh, out of place. They were uh, improper. They were vile and should have been uh, never uttered because they contained stereotypes, because they lumped people into groups, because he, they contained personal attacks on individuals who, without any evidence, were unfairly scapegoated and unfairly libeled by his remarks. What I find truly unfortunate about his remarks is that they call attention to Minister Louis Farrakhan, whom I have found and have known over the last uh, 14 or 15 years to be a man not full of hate, <clears throat> not a hate teacher, not a hater of whites, not a hater of Jews, not one who teaches hatred of whites or hatred of Jews. But because of the unfortunate remarks and because of Minister Farrakhan's reluctance to immediately censure and immediately speak out against these remarks, he was categorized <clears throat> once again, I say unfairly, as one who is a race hater. And this, I think, is the tragedy because the good work that Minister Farrakhan has carried on, which was begun by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the 1930s in Detroit, uh, the good work that Minister Farrakhan has done rehabilitating the, the convicts, the drug addicts, the social uh, misfits in our society among the black community, the good work that he has done of economic rehabilitation is lost because so much attention is now paid to these kinds of uh, unfortunate, condemnable remarks. Do you, uh, are you satisfied with uh, Minister Farrakhan's reaction to Khalil Muhammad's remarks? I think Minister Farrakhan reacted uh, in a way that uh, I applaud. Um, again, realizing that there are people within the black community, there are people elsewhere who find, uh, who, are, who are encouraged, who cheer, when remarks are made which uh, talk about, uh, as he did, uh, about the Pope of Rome and his garments and how he uh, carries himself when he castigates uh, 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 Hollywood uh, uh, personalities. But then I think what happens, unfortunately, is that we really miss uh, all of the, the terrible things that Khalid Abdul Muhammad said and that others have said there have never been any acts of anti-Semitism or violence or hatred, cemetery desecration, um, uh, school or synagogue desecration by black people. If you go to Utah, these acts are not committed by blacks. If you go to Europe, the Zhirinovskis, the, the uh, Mussolinis of the world are not blacks and they're not Muslim. Mr. No, Bookbinder, uh, let me look, I, sure, go right ahead. I, I want to say that uh, despite your efforts to separate uh, Khalid Mohammed from Louis Farrakhan, I must point out Forgive me if I disagree sharply with you on that separation. The fact of the matter is that Khalid Mohammed, when he made that speech in New Jersey, was listed officially, called, respected as the, not just another member of the Nation of Islam, as the spokesman 
for the nation of Islam, and he felt free, in my judgment, he felt free to make those horrible remarks because he felt they were consistent with what he'd been taught by Louis Farrakhan. He'd heard Louis Farrakhan many, many times. And the fact is that there is a record, which part of which I have with me, but it's available to any student of this subject. The record shows that Louis Farrakhan has engaged in every one of those accusations, but with slightly less obnoxious language. But Louis Farrakhan believes that the Judaism is a gutter religion. He has said that. He is no longer denying it, in fact. He has said that. Mr. Uh, he Mr. has... Mr. Bookbinder, I, I, if we could stop on this one All point. Right. On this one point, because this really is a sore point. Um, because uh, Louis Farrakhan never, never, never referred to Judaism or to the faith of the... Uh, Hebrew Jewish people as a gutter religion. The words were misinterpreted on a, uh, a tape recording that was made in the newsroom of the yeah. Chicago Sun-Times of a radio broadcast, the and the word that he used was in fact dirty religion, which again, wait a minute, Very but wait, good, a, isn't but, it? But wait yeah. a minute, but wait a minute, the, the reference was not a reference to the faith of a people, but rather was a reference to the activities and the practices. Well, in the Nation I of Islam, people that we are taught that your religion is your way of life. What activities and, so, and practices was, um, <clears throat> well, he was referring to? It, at, in that speech, as I recall, it was in the 1980s, or 84, I guess it was, in Chicago. It was a radio broadcast. He was referring to, perhaps, I think, the, uh, the state of Israel and uh, some of the policies and politics, which he said they uh, use the uh, prophets, in this case, uh, Moses and uh, Noah and Aaron and some of the the prophets of the Old Testament to shield their dirty religion, which he said was to usurp the land of the Palestinian well, people. Well, let, let me say, if I may, uh, <laughs> perhaps we ought to forget that dirty religion or gutter religion from now on. But, the, right. but I was trying to make this point that it was because Mr. Farrakhan has over the years engaged in this terrible scapegoating of Jews and describing them in <clears throat> unspeakable terms. He was able to speak them nevertheless that we have to understand where this all comes from. Let me interject at this moment. Those things that Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam are doing about crime in the streets, about this epidemic of uh, uh, single motherhood, all of those are welcome. If he did that and nothing else, he could be and should be hailed. But the fact is he wraps all of these things in a philosophy and an advocacy of the crudest kind of race baiting and religion baiting. I want to ask both that of you. That simply is unforgivable. I we want to ask both of you. permit that to go on. A direct question. Uh, in, and maybe it'll seem like a silly question based on your comments, because maybe we know where you stand. But do you believe that uh, Louis Farrakhan is anti Semitic? If he isn't anti Semitic, he's been doing a lot of acting and pretending to be an anti Semite. Uh, same question for you. Is Louis Farrakhan anti Semitic? I have said on national public radio, I have written in columns before, I have said before he said it out of his own mouth uh, uh, in recent remarks that I believe and I would um, look anyone in the eye, any person in the eye and say Louis Farrakhan is not a race hater, he is not a hater of Jews, he does not teach hatred of white people, he does not teach hatred of Jews. Now, um, well, there are some things that he it? says which, which Mr. Yeah. Bookbinder, right. yeah. you're correct, they, 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 they take on the uh, the cloak of, of scapegoating, and in, in the modern definition of anti-Semitism, which has changed over the That's years... That's what I wanted to ask you next. There, there you is, both define anti-Semitism. Um, you know, in the 1930s, I, I had a... I have two, fortunately, editions of Funk and Wagnall's uh, International Dictionary. In the 1935 edition, um, anti-Semitism is defined as uh, uh, speaking against any number of Semite people, which include the uh, uh, Assyrians, which include uh, Jews, which include Arabs, and a number of others from that Semitic region. Uh, in the 1978 edition, it's used uh, uh, almost entirely as uh, statements or uh, comments that are against the Jewish people. It really isn't that difficult to define it. Uh, it isn't even necessary to define it. Uh, you know it when you see it. It's like uh, a famous justice once said about pornography. You know when, when it's pornographic. Uh, the fact is that in the same press conference a few weeks ago, 
when he denied being an anti-Semite and gave some kind of a crazy definition and history of that, you know, all other, a lot of other people are Semites also, he repeated one of the worst, one of the most horrible accusations against the Jewish people by repeating the accusation of the Jews being the primary holders of slavery and importers of slaves to this country. An outrageous lie from beginning to end. He repeated it. He has never explained why he uses language like um, uh, uh, the um, bloodsuckers, which uh, Kalmud, uh, used, Khalid used in his speech in New Jersey. The one thing after another that is being said either by him directly or by his representatives. He can make, he can get on television anytime he wants to. <laughs> Every one of the talk shows would like to have him as a guest. And he can say, these things have been, I've been accused of. Whatever I may or may not have said in the past, I do not think A, B, C, D, E. And he can clear the deck. Well, Don't he's you done think that. He ought to do that? <clears throat> well, I, I believe he has done that. But, you know, this whole... Um, but three this, weeks ago, this, this, this he whole, said we were major <clears throat> slaveholders. Well, you know, th now this whole business How do you began. Explain that this whole business began um, back when the uh, uh, Reverend Jackson was campaigning for president. Mm -hmm. Minister Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, had always and often been accused of being anti-white uh, because of teaching that that uh, and calling for separation of the races. But it wasn't until this 1984 uh, campaign when Reverend Jackson made unfortunate remarks that the uh, question of Jewish influence and uh, there was a, a clash. Yes. And Minister Farrakhan, uh, not one to shrink from a fight, uh, rose and defended himself as uh, anyone might expect, <clears throat> um, reserving that right as many states, including uh, the state of Israel, do. Now. What's happened, <clears throat> what's happened since then is that uh, the attacks against him have been unrelenting, despite efforts on his part to amend fences or to... He can unrelent he's met with He's met with, me with rabbis that. in his home. He's had d dinner in the homes of rabbis. And yet there is this, uh, I believe, fear among people of goodwill to say Minister Farrakhan is an honorable person. Why doesn't, but, he, <clears throat> why doesn't he follow the thing that Jesse Jackson did? There was a time... 10, 15 years ago, when in <coughs> fact Jesse Jackson was considered by many people, I think unfairly, as an anti-Semite, but he too was at that time very careless in the way he discussed the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. But he's learned, he's come around, and I welcome that, and he can do a lot of good. Louis Farrakhan might in the future be able to do a lot of good too, if he sheds all this horrible uh, anti-Jewishness that he has. I, I dare and say... I, I hope <coughs> it can happen, but I do I, want to say one other thing, because uh, forgive me too. Sure, no, go right uh, ahead. I, 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 I know how time goes. Yeah, we want to get some I, I'd rather not have all 60 minutes used to saying what's wrong with black Jewish relations and with Farrakhan Jewish relations. Because I've spent a long lifetime now, close to half a century, involved in the civil rights movement. I may not have a perfect record, but I think I understand the pain and the anger. Blacks in this country have every reason to be angry. I don't want to take that away from anybody. They have every reason to be angry. Despite some improvements, and there have been improvements, some important improvements, blacks are still disproportionately poor, disproportionately uh, discriminated against. It's a terrible situation. But finally, I've always been fond of a quotation made by a man a long, long time ago, Aristotle. Aristotle said, anybody can be angry. It's easy to be angry. But to know how to be angry, against whom to be angry, in what form to show your anger, that doesn't come easily. I agree. It's a lot of wisdom in that. I and I would hope that the anger, the justifiable anger that is there among minority people in this country, uh, can be turned to constructive cooperation, which I'd like to talk about if time permits. Okay, Mr. Muhammad, I'll, I'll I'd like to. Be, I see you're <coughs> preparing to read to us. I have, I have, you, you asked the question, Mr. Bookbinder, yeah. and I'm honored to be here on this program with you as well. <clears throat> uh, about Minister Farrakhan uh, beating this dead horse of Jews and slavery. But I'd like to read from a book. It's uh, uh, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, written by Harold Cruz in 1967. And in this, uh, he uh, speaks about 
uh, in the chapter of Negroes and Jews, the two nationalisms, um, how aware certain Jews were in, is revealed in a very unlikely source, the autobiographical notes of the great Russian writer, Fyodoro M. Dostoevsky, writing about the Jewish question in Russia in the year 1877, he said, quote, but let them be morally purer than all the peoples of the world. Nevertheless, I have just read in the March issue of Messenger of Europe a news item to the effect that in America, in the southern states, they have already leaped en masse upon the millions of liberated Negroes and have already taken a grip upon them in their, the Jews' own way. By means of their sempiternal gold pursuit and by taking advantage of the inexperience and vices of the exploited tribe. Imagine when I read this, I immediately recalled that the same thing came to my mind five years ago, specifically that Negroes have now been liberated from the slave owners, but that they will now last become this, because of the Jews of whom they are so many in the world, will jump at this new little victim. The, I'm, these, surpri I'm, I'm, <coughs> and so, I'm surprised you're reading that. Uh, I'm just saying that the, the question is not a new one, it is one that has yeah. plagued the, the groups and unfortunately because... Are you saying of, you agree with this <coughs> author's observation? No, no, no. What I'm saying is that over the years, over the generations, probably before many of the students here were born, this question divided blacks and Jewish intellectuals and unfortunately even then bl uh, blacks were unafraid, no, were no. afraid to speak on uh, this subject uh, and, 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 and not able to say we have differences, Look, and let's discuss our differences. Let, let me comment let's, briefly let's, on this. Okay. But I, before sure you do, enough. Mr. Book, but yeah. I really need to find out, just for the sake yeah. of clarity, are you saying you agree with the findings of that author? or I'm disagree? saying, I'm saying the, 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 the findings have, are like Minister Farrakhan's references to uh, slaveholding and Jews are historical. They've been documented. And whenever they're uh, brought up, somehow or another, it is the messenger who is condemned rather than the message. And well, I, if, look, if me, we have me, differences, I, really, I, really really I need to just try one more time. And I, my, yeah. my only goal here is to, to get some clarification on this. I really just need to know if you agree with those observations. I understand the historical context you're presenting, but what I, what I want to make mm -hmm. clear to our audience and our viewers are whether or not you agree with those observations. Um, I agree that these observations have been recorded historically and that there's much evidence today of uh, a disproportionate relationship that has existed uh, between blacks and Jews in America. Um, and if we talk about those relationships, if we do a survey as to who the slumlords are in major urban cities and find out are they owned by Jewish landlords or not, we are somehow or another accused of anti-Semitism just in the, yes, pursuit, in, yes, in the pursuit of the question. That is, that is okay. anti-Semitism. Mr. Bookbinder, I'm going to ask you that for is, a brief response all right. so we can that get is to indeed, our That is questions. indeed the essence of anti-Semitism. When you look at a situation and find that some Jews are landlords or some Jews are bankers or some Jews are media people, you say, you see, it's their Jewishness that makes them what they are, and all Jews are A, B, C, oh, D, no. E. That's the nature, that's the definition of bigotry. Of course, over the years, including what you just read, over the years, the Jews have been subjected to the worst kind of character assassinations as a people, and the worst implementation of that, of course, was the, the Holocaust. Next week, we, we have another anniversary of the Holocaust. Uh, so we've got to say no to that. And your earlier comment that it's these things that led to the disarray between black and Jewish intellectuals is just plain wrong. And now let me say what I hope we can talk about in terms of the questions that come to us. The fact is that despite garbage like that and other garbage that's being said about Jews, the history of the last 50 years is a magnificent history of blacks and Jews working together. The American Jewish Committee, with which I was associated, for example, in 1954, commissioned a great psychologist, the greatest psychologist of all, Clark, to write a paper that could be submitted on behalf of the school desegregation case. Blacks and Jews have worked together in the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. I participated actively in all of these battles. Uh, there was a time when we could say happily and proudly that every public opinion survey shows us that blacks are significantly less anti-Semitic than Jews. That was a glorious period to which I want to return and tell you that the cooperation between the two groups has never really ceased. Okay, let's turn to our audience for their questions. And gentlemen, I, obviously there are opportunities to disagree. I'm we'll going to ask great. you to disagree briefly so we can get to as many okay. of these questions and comments as possible. Hi, you're first. Okay, my name is Linda Gualtieri. I'm a junior at the American University. Um, Mr. Muhammad, I have, well, 
actually, I have 10 pages of quotes from Mr. Farrakhan. Um, in my viewpoint, it has been interpreted as anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, anti-feminist, anti-everything. I have pages saying that women are lesser than men, saying that the Pope is the Antichrist, and he organized organized crime, saying tons of things about Jewish people um, controlling uh, Negro people with their money and power. Um, and maybe you say Mr. Farrakhan isn't, isn't a hate person, a hateful person, but the, I feel that the, um, the message that he portrays to the Americans, especially to young people like me, is hateful because that's what I see and that's what plenty of other people see. And I think if he's gonna, if he's gonna make some moves and he's gotta stop supporting this hate. Um, and I, I have to, I say that he's correct, he has targeted the drug problem in the inner cities very well. I think he's done a lot of good work for this. But the thing is that his message supports hate. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but the, um, Congressman Peter King is proposing legislation to cut off federal funding to hate groups. Um, the House is strongly opposed to racism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism, and all forms of ethnic or religious intolerance. Um, and this is why he feels very strongly about this issue and he's supporting this. Now, how do you, what are your personal feelings on this issue, and how do you think Mr. Farrakhan is going to feel about this legislation? L Linda, let me ask you first. Do you, uh, does any of your information about this legislation indicate how uh, determination would be made of <coughs> what groups represent? Yeah, I have a copy of the bill right here with me. Um, I guess, unfortunately, if you know briefly, we don't have time it would, to... It would authorize the Secretary of the Housing and Urban Development to make the decision. Okay, thanks. I would not... Um, disassociate myself from Minister Farrakhan's remarks, just as I would not uh, dissociate myself from the remarks or the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But I would say this, what's happened and was, is that unfortunately <clears throat> Minister Farrakhan uh, paints with an unnecessarily broad brush. Uh, it opens the door for what can be considered scapegoating because uh, you're dealing with individuals, uh, uh, blacks who've been uh, dumped on historically. We've lost the knowledge of ourselves. We've lost our names, our culture, our religion. Um, m many, most like myself, grew up in single parent homes uh, with a mother struggling and working outside the home and children, latchkey kids often uh, growing up in delinquent circumstances, antisocial circumstances to reform these people who have never had uh, uh, any uh, training or teaching on how to be men and women, how to be adults, how to be responsible citizens, law-abiding citizens in the society. And so in that context of teaching to these people who, whose, whose, whose minds are literally caked over with decay and all kinds of uh, uh, disease and uh, uh, social problems, drugs, alcohol, uh, tobacco, uh, in trying to break through with these people, sometimes you need, uh, as the joke goes, uh, 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 a two-by-four or a sledgehammer to get their attention. And in that kind of context, uh, you're not able to do as people should do, which is be specific. Uh, speak about individuals. Speak about uh, the individual crimes rather than the activities of what appear to be a group. And that is what I would say is unfortunate. And perhaps, and I would hope certainly that in the future, uh, he will be specific and confine his remarks to specific individuals, specific cases, rather than appearing to say all Catholics, all Jews. Uh, he has friends uh, and who attend his meetings, uh, pastors, Father George Clements, uh, uh, a black pastor, uh, 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 Father, um, uh, oh, I, his, his face I can see, but I can't remember his name, a white pa uh, priest in Chicago who is a, a friend and acquaintance. May I ask you whether you <coughs> asked... Uh, Louis Farrakhan to change uh, his language and stop accusing groups as group. Have you been in touch with him? I know you've I, known him in the past. I've, I've known him. Uh, I've never had an opportunity to. Well, why don't you find You know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, 6 or 7 years ago, he, uh, when this controversy came up, you know, he said, and I've never had an opportunity to interview him. I'd like to. Yeah. Well, did you to, ask, to ask him, uh, he said, you know, why are these problems happening between myself and the Jews? This is a prime question, he said, which should be asked 
I wasn't in a position because I don't want to just ask for myself. I'd like to ask for the radio microphones, being the vain journalist I am, uh, wanting to have an audience here my, for myself, here for themselves. But what he says, I'd like to ask him, why is there this friction between yourself and the you Jews? Know, Mr. Muhammad, uh, uh, Mr. Bookbinder earlier said he didn't think definitions were important. But uh, as we attempt to understand this and come to it with an open mind, uh, I get a little hung up on the definitions. And what I'm unclear about, what you seem to be saying, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, is that we should ignore the words, not hold a person accountable for their choice of words, but rather focus on their intentions. But then the problem becomes, how do you find out what their intentions are once they've chosen the words they've chosen? Could you give us some clarification on your position of how accountable a public figure should be for the words that he or she chooses? I think, uh, once again, the remarks of Louis Farrakhan have been taken <clears throat> out of context. Perhaps he never recognized, even in 1984, when he made this unfortunate speech that led to the gutter religion misquote, that there were people listening beyond just the black community. Uh, when we in the black community and the Nation of Islam became acquainted with him, we uh, rallied to him because he was a champion of the teaching of Mr. Muhammad, that he was speaking words that could penetrate the, the, the clouded minds of blacks and, and rally black people to, to want to do something for ourselves and our well, families. Mr. Muhammad, uh, and, 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 and that is what we embraced in his remarks. And he, I don't think he realized that yeah. other people were actually listening let, let to him say, other than just let blacks. Let me say most respectfully, I don't know why you have trouble seeing anti-Semitism in Farrakhan's <coughs> performance when 98 out of 100 senators saw it, when about 400 members of the House of Representatives saw it, when almost every <coughs> respected columnist in America, an editorial writer, has seen it, when the president of Howard University, the distinguished black university here, the best one in the country by far, the president wrote in the post of two weeks ago, the Washington Post, saying, among other things, we must respond to this issue of saying things about groups when, wherever it emerges and whatever the cost. And then it says, in their memory, the memory of Goodman, Schwerner, and uh, Cheney, two Jews and a black who got killed while working for the Voting Rights Act, in their memory and in the memory of all those other valiant foot soldiers in the struggle, we can do no less than to decry the seeds of anti-Semitism that some would plant on the nation's campuses. This is a great president of a great university saying it. I don't know why you're having difficulty joining with these people. You know, gentlemen, I'm, I'm as guilty of not getting to as many questions as you All are, right. so I don't say this in an accusatory way, but since we're, we're really halfway through our discussion, maybe we could try it a little more formally. What we'll ask you to do is when you ask your question, if you direct it to one of our two guests, and then after that person has answered the other, we'll have a, a brief opportunity okay. to respond, and we'll, then we'll get back I'll to another. Let's get to as I'll many as we can. Thanks. Who's, I'm sorry, we're not going to allow follow-ups because you had the mic for a long time. Let's go to our next. Okay, my name is Maria Kastner, and I'm a freshman at the American University. Um, going back to the speech at King College earlier, um, that speech obviously had a lot of people upset, and I wonder if maybe um, the reason for that style that Mr. Farrakhan did not um, approve of if that style does represent a portion of the black population's feelings. And if that's the case, if there is a simmering um, frustration there, um, is it going to be possible then to proceed with constructive measures between blacks and Jews if that um, feeling of hatred or distrust or frustration is there? Um, I've seen a lot of drug rehabilitation and um, help with the inner city by the Nation of Islam, and I wonder if the Jewish community has a response to that and how you intend to work together to help those problems. Okay, Maria, and who did you direct your question to? Would you like to hear from both? Um, yes. Both, yeah. Okay, if you could both mm -hmm. give us a brief response. Well, let me say, as I indicated earlier, let me just say as quickly as I can, the cooperation between the blacks and Jews have continued despite these recent irritations and problems. The Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, which has 200 major organizations working for civil rights, has about a dozen major national Jewish organizations and black organizations. We continue to work together. Only two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was, at, I was at a White House ceremony where the president signed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. There were blacks there, there were Jews there. We cooperated and we continued to cooperate. There was an ad that my organization sponsored in the New York Times several weeks ago. 250 people signed it. We went to 
everybody bought leadership, and I won't take the time to read it now, but there are dozens of outstanding black Americans who joined in a statement decrying the division that this recent fracas has, has caused. And that included Roger Wilkins, I, I mentioned before. It included Congressman John Lewis, who was one of the great freedom riders in the 60s. We have to find things to cooperate on and work, because there are too many unsolved problems. That's why I expressed the hope at the beginning that we wouldn't spend all the time on the disagreements, but what can we do in a positive way to alleviate the, the condition, not only for blacks, but for all Americans? Mr. Muhammad. I would agree, and I would say that if we ever can reach the point where there is not called for a mea culpa on the part of blacks who, like Harold Cruz, like Jimmy Baldwin, like others who have uh, had their differences, like Richard Wright, who've had their differences with uh, whites in the mainstream and whites even in the progressive movements. If there's ever the time when we can have uh, a go without having this mea culpa so that a Louis Farrakhan uh, need not uh, uh, genuflect and, and, and crawl on broken glass on hands and knees to say... I'm not asking for that. I'm, I, I'm I, not asking for that. Uh, you know, I repent, I recant, uh, please uh, accept me as, a, as your equal. If we can ever get past the point where this kind of recrimination goes on and we can speak and say, well, we have differences, but we can disagree without being disagreeable, that we can lay these things aside. Uh, in 1974, I met Yasser Arafat at the UN, uh, and uh, when he came for his first U.S. appearance, uh, he was persona non grata until last September when, <coughs> out of the blue, because of the Danish Channel, he and the Israelis had negotiated a settlement that would hopefully lead that troubled area to peace. I can say if, if there's a, a channel, a secret channel, be it through Norway or Den Denmark or wherever it might be, that Jews in America and members of the Nation of Islam, those disaffected blacks who uh, have these uh, angry views, can speak about things that we can work on in common rather than having to disagree and argue, then perhaps we might be able to reach the, the, the point of, of cooperation about which you speak. But bear in mind, there are some serious differences with regard to uh, aspirations that African Americans now express wanting self-determination, wanting uh, some sense of, uh, of self-expression, control of their own finances. Louis Farrakhan which, is not the which, first one to say those which, things. Of course not, but then yeah. there well, are... He's not th the leader of black America. There, there are th these views of self-expression, self-determination, find, uh, are not embraced totally by all whites, and there is much dialogue to be had on the substantive issues as well. Okay. Hi. Lori Keeling, American University. With Farrakhan's sparking hatred amongst his supporters, as I believe he does, how do we maintain the freedom of speech while also protecting ourselves from sparking another hatred movement such as that sparked by Hitler? Well, I'll give you a quick answer. It, I don't know of any Jewish leader or other leader that has said that uh, Khalid Mohammed had no right to make that speech. He has a right under our laws to say thing other than personal libel. He can say it. What we say is that those who hear him, the, pres the, pre the president of that university, teachers who are there, should speak out and say why they disagree with it. Repudiating a speech is not the same as uh, making it impossible to make that speech. Mr. Muhammad, I have a quick question for you. The size of the nation of Islam, there are conflicting reports of the numbers. Do you have an opinion on how large or small? <laughs> I don't. Um, it's a really debatable topic, but uh, here in Washington, D.C., Minister Farrakhan spoke on two Mondays ago to a group of black men only, uh, and 10,000 uh, men uh, appeared at the D.C. Armory. Did you hear that? Men uh, only. 10,000 men appeared at the D.C. Armory, and why shouldn't men get together and discuss the problems that they have without the ego tripping, without the vanity and performing because women are present, because you want to uh, maintain that kind of macho style that, that, that men sometimes get into when they think they're posturing for women. Why shouldn't men address the problems that men have in, a, in an honest, frank way? No. Because uh, all too often, black men do walk away from uh, uh, children they fathered. They, uh, the population that he spoke to at the D.C. Armory is equal to the
the population at the Lorton Prison Reformatory. And I think that is a significant number. Uh, if In New York, he spoke to 15,000 and turned 5,000 away. How big is the Nation of Islam? I don't know. But if you judge by the numbers of people who are attracted to Minister Farrakhan, I dare say that um, uh, a majority of, of, of black people sympathize or, or embrace some of the views that are a part of the nation of Islam. Look at the, the diet habits of black people today. Uh, how many people, uh, particularly among the black community, but other communities as well, for health reasons and other reasons, no longer eat pork. Uh, this is taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1959 in his book, How to Eat to Live. Uh, give up pork, eat one meal a day. How often do we well, see that's these? A, that's these a basis for unity. I don't need pork either. <laughs> these, how often do we see I'm these use, changes? Use the pork opening to go to our next question or comment. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi. My name is Keith Halverstam. I go to Washington University in St. Louis. My question is for Mr. Muhammad, and it is, you discuss that Mr. Farrakhan is not an anti-Semite, but if that is the case, with all the issues facing the black community, like you talked about, like the single parenthood, why does he focus so much on the Jewish issue? Why does he bring up statistics that anybody who goes to the library, like I did last night, can see are wrong? Why does he go on the Arsenio Hall show and focus half of his time on the Jewish manipulation of the media? When there's so much good to be done, why does anybody in the black community need to follow someone who spews hate? There are people like Hitler... Okay, Keith, I'm, I'm okay, sorry. We'll, we'll get an answer to your question. I think that's you a made good question, you know. And, uh, but I would ask you in return, why is it that, um, that uh, Jewish Americans are so exercised by what Minister Farrakhan has said when, if you look at uh, um, uh, Dr. Chancellor Williams' seminal book, uh, The Destruction of Black Civilization, uh, if you listen to Minister Farrakhan's remarks as well, where he condemns Arabs for their participation and being enriched by the slave trade, where he condemns the African nations themselves, the African kings and potentates who sold our people into slavery, why is it that those people don't scream out and say, you're being anti-Semitic because we Arabs are Semites and you're being anti-Arab by attacking the Arab role in the slave trade? What you're attacking the Ghanaian role, you're attacking the Togolese role, you're attacking the African king's role in the slave trade. Well, why me, is it that these people your first, don't your, scream your out as well? Before, you wonder why gonna, Jews speak out so much on this. Look, in a year when we've seen Schindler's List, we've seen a Holocaust Museum, and next week we celebrate the anniversary, we, we observe the anniversary again, Jews dare not be silent because pe they were silent in the 30s and nobody was asked to speak out to condemn the early anti-Semitism of Hitler. And when you're quiet and don't do anything about it, the poison can spread. That's my answer. I just, I, I need to, I want to ask you, Mr. Hamid, if you would address Keith's question specifically, which was, uh, why does Mr. Farrakhan, in Keith's view, spend as much time as he does talking about Jewish issues rather I, than other issues? I believe that he is defending himself against the attacks which are li brought against him rather than uh, instigating trouble against the Jews. I dare say that if we want to really attack the problem of anti-Semitism in America, let's go to Idaho, let's go to Colorado, let's go to Utah, where the pogroms are taking place today, let's go to Hungary, let's go to Italy, sure. let's go sure. to Russia, where Zhirinovsky uh, has invited the South African whites who are disaffected with majority rule to come there, and who has, uh, uh, in, es in essence, uh, suggested uh, even more anti-Semitic remarks. Let's go to the these places where there is a history of of not only a verbal, uh, no but there's a history of actions against Jewish people, and let's attack those places and problems, but in America, the history of America, you don't have one incident when there's a, a, a Jewish school or cemetery desecrated in this area, where does it happen? At Wheaton, it doesn't happen in Southeast D.C., it doesn't happen in the hood, it happens in neighborhoods where there are whites who are, uh, in this instance, uh, in a sense, blameless. I say. Minister Farrakhan defends himself against those uh, uh, verbal attacks, but he does not engage, his followers do not engage in the acts against Jewish people or any other white people. Rather, they're busy trying to do the work of rehabilitating a lost people and are distracted by so many attacks Do you, do you uh, think the he media. invites the attacks by the language he chooses? Uh, I think that um, he does not back down from his, uh, his, uh, his positions, and for that, uh, he is not credited with being a courageous, fearless person, but rather he is seen as being inflexible, and perhaps uh, he is inflexible, but uh, um, uh, who is to say what is the reason for his, uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, um, uh, what's the word, uh, 
um, being uh, so uh, intransigent or being so um, steadfast. Okay. Next question. Yes, sir. Afternoon. My name is Jason Zuckerman. This question is for Mr. Muhammad. Um, it seems as though the controversy over the past few months has been an accusation um, of who said what. Um, it's been going back and forth, and all it's been is a word game, really. The question I have is, is, is there a way to put this sort of a diversion aside and work on some concrete issues right now? And if so, I'm wondering if, if you could make some suggestions for what some of those issues would be. Okay. Before you answer, I want to put a little pressure. I, ha I hate to be so crass about uh, the color of people's skin, because I, I try not to think that way. But this is clearly an issue that does break down sometimes along those lines. And we haven't heard from any of our African-American guests. And I don't want to put pressure on you if, you're not, if you don't want to ask a question or make a con comment. Clearly, you don't have to. But if you would like to, we'd like to hear from you as well. Because we did have a problem. Some of our Howard University students were unable to make it today. And we're not sure why. Maybe tied up in traffic, which is often a problem here in Washington, D.C. But uh, I'll let you respond to the question, and then, I, as I said, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but we'd love to hear from you if you want to. E economic cooperation. There are many areas of education, of reform, of, uh, of prison uh, activities, social work, in which um, there's a lot of expertise in the Jewish community, which the Nation of Islam, for one, uh, is actively involved in uh, work in those areas uh, and in, throughout the black community. Uh, I think there are areas in which uh, blacks and Jews can cooperate and uh, where that cooperation would certainly be welcome uh, by uh, black people who, uh, despite uh, their angry looks, their uh, berets turned to the side and dark glasses and, I hope and gritted teeth and, and clenched fists and black leather jackets I hope it would won't, welcome that. I hope that, it won't sound too self-serving for me to observe that a few months before he died, Arthur Ashe was arrested in front of the White House for picketing on behalf of the Haitians. I was arrested at the same time with him. I, I tell you this as symbolic of the black Jewish cooperation that is going on on an important issue like that. There was a black Jewish demonstration in this area conducted a few months ago on behalf of gun control. In other words, not only do we, should we try to find areas of cooperation. I remind you again, it is continuing now. And Jews have also been quite uh, vocal in condemning the uh, ethnic cleansing and that hateful activity that's going on mm -hmm. in Croatia, which is of concern to many Muslims and uh, concern to many blacks. Mr. Bookbinder, you, you've made a point time and time again during this discussion that the, of, about the cooperation that's going on versus the disagreement. Mm -hmm. that, could you put in perspective for us uh, you know, uh, what size is this uh, problem in, the, in the, the big picture that you keep describing of cooperation? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm asking a clear question, but well, what I'm getting at I, is, is I this, is this a little rift? I, is it a major dispute? Uh, is, it doesn't merit all the attention it's getting, with all due respect to your program. I mean, you know, no it has to be done. Uh, it is serious, but it is not devastating. And I, if I can leave just this one message out of this program, that while we have to continue working on this and hoping that there is a new Farrakhan sometime in the future uh, or, or that it goes away altogether, I guess that would be better even, uh, we, we don't want to believe that there is no sense of understanding. We do understand one another's pain. Some of the black leaders in this country are very active on behalf of Jewish security, whether it be in Israel or whether it be anywhere else, and Jews do continue to understand the pain of the blacks in this country. Okay, from your broken record moderator, time is short, so let's see how many more questions and comments we can get to. Hello, my name is Kathy Wilbright. I'm a student at Howard University. The conversation keeps coming back to why uh, Minister Farrakhan spends so much time speaking about race. And my question is to Mr. Muhammad, is it possible to deal with the inner city problems that African Americans face without raising the color question and while examining um, power, the power structure and while examining who controls the resources? Kathy, what's your opinion on that before you, we have Mr. Muhammad answer? I think that the color question is indeed a, a part of um, the inner city problems. I think that we cannot separate where we are today from our past. Okay, thanks. Ironically, we, as, uh, this week, the uh, courts in North Carolina are hearing an a, a important, a pivotal case of, of racial uh, 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 justice, you might say, with regard to voting rights. And so, you know, in, 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 in one term, we're, we hear the expression, well, 
uh, blacks, you know, get your power at the ballot box. Mal Malcolm X said the ballot or the bullet, and he suggested that there ought to be some parity between the black population and black representation in Congress. Uh, and so during the 1990 census, when there was a reapportionment of uh, seats from, in Congress from the industrial north to the south, where you still have a majority or a large plurality black population, when activities were, uh, when legislatures were, drew up uh, districts that might give blacks voting powers, because historically whites have never, ex in the case, except in the case of Massachusetts with Ed Brooke, in the case of Alan Wheaton, in Kansas and the case of uh, Ron Dellums in Berkeley, but otherwise historically whites have never voted white blacks uh, elected officials on a national level into office. So if blacks must elect blacks or be in districts in order to elect blacks, now we've got these districts and all of a sudden, well, even in, in the Bush White House, the Bush administration and Republicans conspired along with those who were drawing these lines because that would dilute the liberal voting strength in, in white suburban districts that Democrats represent. So now all of a sudden you've got a, 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 a seminal jump in the black population, the Congressional Black Caucus, 50% increase, the, the, and blacks are, are therefore uh, a power block at last. Now you've got suits to say, well, there shouldn't be black voting districts. I believe that the solution to blacks' problems is a separate solution. I think blacks there, there is, must go to ourselves. There is no we area. Must, we must get together among ourselves and deal with the problems that we suffer as a result of uh, miseducation, as a result of um, uh, bad food, bad religion, bad teaching, uh, bad social experiences, and solve our problems together without having others interfere whose uh, interests are served often by continuing to keep us as perennial consumers. Yeah. To put this in the context of today's discussion, I want to remind everybody that there is no issue that saw a greater, more marvelous area of cooperation between blacks and Jews than in the furtherance of the Voting Rights Act. We mentioned earlier, Jews and blacks both died in order to get make possible the power black that now exists in the country. In my home state of Mississippi, yes. where also Emmett Till was sa savagely yes. killed, and it's a Okay. Your Evans. Yes. All right, who's next? Yes, sir. Brent Terry, and I'm a student at Howard University. Um, in the past, we have always discussed the issues between the Jews and the blacks. Why are we focusing on um, issues that other racial groups are focusing on, the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazis in um, other cities? Would you, are you suggesting, Brett, that you'd like to see uh, Mr. Farrakhan or other spokespersons bring those issues up, or are you talking about in well, the context of this discussion? Well, everyone, everyone within the, on the Jewish community as well as the black community. And in all I think other that's the point I was trying to make about Hungary, about Italy, yeah. uh, Mussolini's granddaughters elected to Congress, uh, about uh, Russia, about uh, throughout Europe, Germany, uh, the uh, uh, Nazis, the skinheads are marching throughout Europe, and those same problems we see here in America are not problems that we see in the ghettos. You don't see this in, in music videos, the boys in the hood, uh, Ice Cube and Ice T, although they've had Minister Farrakhan in their videos, are not the ones committing the pogroms we were, in 1994. We were no less adamant about David Duke than we are now about Louis Farrakhan. So we understand where there's an enemy of freedom and justice and equality, we're going to be there working with blacks and others. Okay, who's next? Hi, Hi my name is Brendan Shank. I'm School of Public Affairs from uh, American University. Um, <clears throat> Time magazine, February 28th, Farrakhan was quoted as uh, rebuking Khalid Abdul Muhammad's uh, or mockery of, of what he said, but could not disavow this anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, and anti-gay truths that he had spoken. And now we hear the same kind of rhetoric, just using words such as unfortunate and condemnable from you, Mr. Muhammad. Now, what exactly are some of the tenets towards uh, gays, Catholics, and um, Jews and the Nation of Islam? Well, um, the, uh, uh, in the Nation of Islam, we teach um, that uh, human beings should not have sex out of marriage. Uh, I've told my son, who's 16, uh, and I've advised him, and I believe it's good advice, that at age 16 is no time uh, to uh, um, begin having sexual liaisons, it's time to concentrate on your studies. I, I have told him and my daughter who graduates in about 60 days from Brown University that there are more important things than having sex uh, before you're married. Uh, given that construct, um, 
uh, if, if, if we believe, and I do, and uh, people in the Nation of Islam are taught that human beings should not have sex out of marriage or with anyone other than one's spouse, then uh, there doesn't leave much room for uh, homosexual liaisons. And certainly we're in agreement with the Bible and the Holy Quran, the book of scripture of the Muslims, um, and the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. Uh, so to say, however, that we're intolerant of individuals, no. Uh, we're not intolerant of individuals, regardless of what their condition is or what their lifestyle may be. But there are certain practices that are, that, are, that are not acceptable. I'm sorry. I really don't mean to be disrespectful by interrupting you. I just want to get to this final question. But uh, if you could, in 30 seconds also, you, you covered uh, the question about, Brendan, you said, ask about gay, um, Jewish, and Catholic. If you could qu briefly comment on any tenets uh, in the Nation of Islam that address Catholics or, or Jews. Well, we believe, as, sorry, Jews and, and, as, we believe as Jews and Christians believe that there is one God and that... Uh, we believe that uh, in the prophets of God throughout the Bible, in the, the New Testament, the, the Old Testament, and in the Holy Quran, the book of scripture of the Muslims, uh, we uh, 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 believe that the, some of these teachings, uh, the, the, the teachings of, of Christ have perhaps <coughs> have been tampered with over time, but then these are differences that can be uh, worked out, we believe, with fair-minded people, God-fearing people who... Uh, embrace faith and believe in the one God. Okay, thanks. Hi. You're gonna, going to have the last question, I guess. Hi, my name is Amy Hanna, and I'm a sophomore at the American University. And my question is, um, Mr. Bookbinder, you had discussed earlier that you feel that people should be angry, and you both have discussed a lot about this anger. Don't you think, though, this anger impedes any further movement forward? Because if both groups spend so much time being angry, it kind of seems like it's going to hinder anything and it's just going to perpetuate the problems. Well, I, remember I quoted Aristotle. Right. And what he said was that it's easy to be angry, it's not easy to know how to be angry. And all I was advocating was an anger that is controlled, that is directed in the right way, and you look for constructive answers. I think I know what you're getting at. Uh, but I cannot say to you that I'll stop being angry at people who vilify my people. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be disappointed. But it doesn't mean I have a right to pick up a gun and do whatever I want about it. We, we, we have to go out and educate the people, advocate sound legislation, and I believe that we're doing that. I, I see the moderator's telling us just about over, so let me, <laughs> let, me, let me make my final few words uh, now and just say that uh, I welcome these discussions, the ones I'm having with you, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, it's been a civil discussion. Uh, we need more of that, and I hope that we can contribute to more of that to get the right constructive answers to replace the anger that people feel. But I cannot underline too much. I understand, as much as any person outside the ranks can understand, why people who are poor, people who have no hopes, people who are discriminated against, why they're upset with the system. And it isn't for demagogues to come and use that anger for wrong purposes. I hope we can continue to work together and make this a better world. Okay. Uh, we're not speaking... You will have the final word, Mr. Muhammad, about 40 seconds worth. Go ahead. We're not speaking about demagoguery. We're not speaking about picking up guns. But I dare say to whites, to Jews, to Catholics, to people of all uh, stripes and, dis and, and descriptions in this country, um, blacks, there is a sense of anger and frustration, of pain in the black community. And until people are able to recognize and deal with the hurt the, of 300 years of chattel slavery, of 100 years of lynching, until you're able to deal with that, you'll find more and more black people saying when your churches are hit by tornadoes, when your presidents are slain, that the chickens have come home to roost. We don't want this to be the message that black people are represented as giving entirely. But until you're able to recognize that and let black people be themselves, you're going to have more and more chaos and confusion and consternation. Skia Mohammed, Hyman Bookbinder, thank you for joining thanks. us. Yeah. Thanks to you as well. Hope you enjoyed us. Uh, we're completely out of time. Hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks for watching. Close Up is a non-profit, non-partisan group that brings high school students and senior citizens from across the nation to Washington to experience the democratic process firsthand. 
The close-up participants are encouraged to visit with congressional representatives, attend seminars, and participate in teleconferences during their stay in Washington. Sunday, April 10th, we'll look at the first five years of book notes.